The Legend of Jimmy Spoon by Christiana Gregory, Chapter 29, Spring, 1856. The snows melted slowly as the sun gained strength. Woodpeckers rattled against the trees, searching for worms in the thawing bark. Wildflowers spread color across, spread color over the hills, like a patchwork quilt. In meadows, blossoms from the blue camas were so plentiful it looked as if there were small lakes. Jimmy was happy he hadn't caused any more fights and that the Indians accepted him as one of their own now. There had been no quarrels in camp. An elder had died in her sleep, and one papoose was stillborn, but otherwise all was peaceful. Washaki moved camp downriver several miles for better grass. Mountain sheep jumped along the rocks above. Everywhere Jimmy looked there were antelope, white-tailed deer, geese, and ducks. While Jimmy hunted with Nampa, Old Mother aired out their sleeping robes. She and Hanabi let laid them over the anthills so the insects would carry away the winter's grease. Sunshine soaked the furs with a rich, fresh smell. The women rinsed all the clothes and blankets in the river, then spread them over bushes to dry. Jimmy liked the way Indian women cleaned in their calm, no-fuss way. He remembered his mother's spring cleaning and the fury with which she and his sisters scrubbed walls, corners, under beds, behind furniture, and inside places Jimmy had never thought of. They were constantly at war with dirt, every hour of the day, every season of the year. The big fish Washaki had told Jimmy about began to swim up river. They were as huge as he had promised. After they had stopped flopping on the bank, Jimmy could lift two at a time, slippery as they were. It was like carrying a younger sister, he it was like carrying his younger sisters, he thought. Annie under one arm, Rose under the other. Jimmy learned to throw back the female fish, for they had a sour, mushy taste, which Shockey told him another reason. Those fish will die out if they cannot lay their eggs. The salmon were fat and delicious, especially after they were smoked on racks and low tents. Hanabi and Old Mother dried enough to fill several tall sacks. By May, they had moved camp down river, then along a canyon deep and rocky, full of snow from avalanches now hardened to ice. There was no timber. Cliffs towered above them. Bighorn sheep sometimes kicked loose stones, which rattled and bounced to the bottom. Eagles soared overhead. They keep watch for us, old mother said. They tell their friends, the animals, we are coming, and we will need them. This way, the animals won't fear us. Now they headed up a steep ravine over a narrow switchback trail near the area where white men would soon build the mining town of Virginia City. On the crest, they could see the other side, where a lush pine forest spread down to a green prairie. To the north, a fork of the Big Hole River ran through a deep gorge. They camped for weeks along a sandy beach. Pronghorn antelope grazed on the surrounding sagebrush, often leaping playfully and showing off their white bellies. Jimmy and Washaki hunted every day so Old Mother could make tao. Jimmy strung the long curved bear claws Nampa had given him onto a strand of twisted sinew. The necklace rattled against his chest as he walked to Nahani's teepee. He wanted to remind her how brave he was around bears. He scratched politely at the teepee's closed flap, then waited for a voice to invite him in. He scratched a second time. When no one answered, Jimmy turned to leave. As he did, he noticed Big Fish Girl. She stood by her mother in front of another teepee. They were not smiling. Big Fish Girl was eyeing Jimmy's necklace as she had his fishing pole. Jimmy hurried toward his lodge as if he'd suddenly forgotten something. He knew it would be safer to wrestle a grizzly than it would be to make Big Fish Girl mad again. And that's the end of chapter 29.